The views and comments expressed on the following radio program by its hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect the views of rmconair.com or its affiliates. Listener discretion is advised. Peace. Welcome to the Knowledge Peace. of Self show. My name is uh, Tere Allah. I'm going to go ahead and let my brothers introduce themselves to my left. Peace. This is Jerul Allah. Peace. This is Jock Hill Knowledge Allah. And I got uh, my son with me. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Peace. My name is Joel Sims and I'm 12 years old. Indeed, indeed. So um, tell me, how do you see today's mathematics? Today's mathematics. Well, what is today's mathematics first? Today's mathematics is knowledge God or being born to build and destroy. I see that as knowledge being look, listen, and observe, and God being supreme being. And when you put when I put that all together, I see it as when you look, listen, and observe, you can you can build and destroy the stuff that is in your life to become a better person. Do um what you want to do. Indeed. Peace. 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 Good job, guys. So it's good to see the youth uh, build on anything positive. In this case, we like to uh, have our youth come in every show and talk a little bit about the uh, mathematics and how it's uh, uh, being lived out in their life. So our subject for today is titled Knowledge God. So I wanted to begin um, briefly with a, a brief tirade, so to speak, uh, in terms of knowledge God and what that means to me um, as a man. Uh, we can just deal with something as simple as the language that we speak, because in our nation we do apply our mathematics and our alphabets and everything that we learn into our own uh, language. So one thing I was uh, mentioning to a colleague of mine was this idea of the weak end. So if we know God, we understand that the week does not end. And why do I say that? The last show that we had was on a Sunday. Here we are again another Sunday. The week did not end, so we begin again. So essentially, we want to keep uh, this planet firmly in people's minds that the whole idea of God is it has no beginning and no ending. And when I say we are God, we're referring to a whole body of people if we know what God is. Now, uh, today's show, we're going to address a few questions. The first thing is, uh, is God a man? Number two is, what is the danger of putting faith in religion? And I think that's one of, uh, one of the, the hot topics, um, actually, in the modern world, but it has always been a hot topic. Uh, number three, what is the difference between knowledge and belief? This is a knowledge-based show, so anytime we use the word belief, we're using that word carefully in terms of we always seek to know things as, as opposed to believing in them. 
which is why we have to take ourselves through a really intense type of uh, study in our own personal lives and together when we put this show together. Um, and number four, what role does faith play? So in everyone's life, we are uh, or have been taught to believe in something. And what do we have faith in besides ourselves? So the thing that we're advocating on today's show is that what's most important is that men and women have faith in themselves. So we want to go ahead and begin with uh, defining some of the terms that you're going to hear used on today's show. The first term is faith. And I'm going to go ahead and read this so that there's no confusion uh, I can always paraphrase the definition, but it's always good to share what's in a modern English definition. Um, faith is confidence or trust in a person or thing. For example, faith in another's ability, belief that is not based on proof. So if we talk about faith within the context of knowledge God, it's the idea that you are relying on something other than yourself. Uh, you have faith that you're going to get a job. Are you going to get a job if you don't go out and look for it? Uh, the probability is extremely low. I wanted to go ahead and, uh, again, pass it along to, to my brother so that we can each have an opportunity to build on uh, the first word, and we'll, we'll keep it moving like that. Jerul? Yeah, peace. Um, yeah, peace. faith uh, is one of those things that various and most people use but really don't, I guess, uh, have a conscious concept of what it really means uh, you know to me faith is one of those things that you know is subject to change mm -hmm. you could be faithful that uh, you know you'll be able to pay your rent at the end of the month without a job but that's not something that's necessarily rooted in fact if you don't have a certain mathematical regimen in place so that you can you know uh, acquire that that uh, income so that you can pay your rent, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's basically one of the things that I like to build on as it relates to faith. Um, how you see it? Indeed, uh, peace. So, peace. <clears throat> you know, I think, like you said, faith is one of those things that um, are often used but misunderstood. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in this day and time, I think, me personally, when I look at faith, I don't deal in faith. Um, you know, what I'm saying I deal in knowledge, things that I know I can prove. Um, I can make sure they happen over and over again. Like you're talking about, um, you know, people are faithful that they're going to get the money for the rent, right? But then your car breaks or, you know, you need some new shoes or something, something crazy happens in your life and you're mm -hmm. like, oh, man, well, you know, I thought it was going to happen. I was faithful it was going to happen, but it didn't mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's one of those things that people are often faithful in things. Um, but, you know, I think that also leads to an opportunity of disappointment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you almost set yourself up for that. Right, it's, especially when it comes to relationships. So do we want to walk away and, and let's say we get married, right? And we want to say, you know, I have faith that this marriage will work. Or do we want to tell people that we know this marriage or this relationship will work? So knowledge is, is, is way more powerful than saying, um, I have the faith that this is actually going to work out for the best. Actually, I know it's going to work out for the best is a little bit more of an oath, so to speak. Let's I, move on. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I think that's, that's important because, you know, with knowledge, it comes a lot of work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of times people want to put in the work in whatever it is that they're involved in. So, you know, you're, you're more accountable. You're more accountable when it comes to knowledge than, you know, when you can say, oh, I have faith in it. You don't necessarily have to work, and there's no work behind that, you right. know. So. Mm -hmm. Knowledge God. So let's uh, take it on to uh, religion. Uh, Jeru, would you mind uh, reading religion to sure. the people? Thank you. So religion, the definition is belief in God or in the doctrines or teachings of religion. The firm faith of the pilgrim's belief in anything as a code of ethics, standards of merit, etc. Now... <laughs> As far, as far as religion is concerned, and I, and I like the fact that we use a definition that mentioned the pilgrims. So for those of you who uh, may have fallen asleep during history class, one of the things we should remember about the pilgrims is that they came to the New World to escape religious persecution. Mm -hmm. And then when they encountered the indigenous people of the Americas, they then began persecuting them mm -hmm. because of their indigenous way of life. So the way I see it, and, and many people in our nation have, have uh, written or taught about this same subject, that it's religion that has actually created a lot of the chaos in the world. Um, many of the wars that we see today 
uh, their origin is in religion. The fact that people did not um, agree with a specific book or they wanted to live a, a, a different way of life. And sometimes religion is imposed on people. Actually, most times it's imposed on people, right. um, especially in terms of uh, the holidays that we have. Uh, some of us are just sucked into, wow, okay, we have to buy this gift in order to show that we are um, good people or we're righteous. But in essence, the roots of all of that has a lot to do with religion. Peace. Okay? Yeah. Peace. Indeed. Indeed. Um, yeah, like you said, religion, I think it's one of those things that um, causes a lot of conflict and confusion. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it also, like you said, it puts you in a box, mm. and I think that's the that's the uh, aspect that causes the confusion. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because at that point, whatever doesn't fit inside your box of of what is supposed to be right, or mm. what God is supposed to be, or you know um, how you're supposed to live, obviously becomes in conflict with that. Mm -hmm. Peace. So moving on with uh, the next uh, definition, it's uh, number three. Shaquille. Indeed. Peace. So, Peace. belief. Confidence in the truth or existence of something not immediately susceptible to rigorous proof. So, um, you know, belief, again, that's one of those things. It's like a mystery. It's almost like dealing with magic. You know, <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you know it's not real and you know it's a trick, but you kind of believe that it's true anyway. Mm -hmm. You really think that dude's pulling a quarter from behind your ear mm -hmm. that's magically been sitting there all day and, mm -hmm. and you didn't know about it and he <laughs> somehow pulled it out of nowhere. Right. Right. And, and, and you notice, and this is uh, for, for the listening or viewing audience, you notice that these terms are somewhat um, interchangeable. Faith, uh, belief in religion, you notice how they're, they're somewhat similar. So now, um, since we're going to show and prove today that, you know, God is a man as opposed to a spirit or something that you can't see, uh, we want to go ahead and hit you with the next term. Uh, it's God. And God is uh, defined as the one supreme being, the creator and ruler of the universe, the supreme being considered with reference to a particular attribute, for example, the God of Islam. So when my brothers and I, and we, we all say that we are one and God is one. We're making reference to the fact that God is a body of people. And we'll have an opportunity to build more on that um, as the, the show progresses. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, hit you all with the last uh, term, which is uh, number five. Jeru. Okay, number five is man. Uh, man is basically uh, the first known use is before the 12th century. Um, from my understanding, it was actually, it came from Sanskrit and um, it came from the god Manu. Uh, Manu was an Indian god that was said to be like, I guess equivalent to Allah or the, the God Almighty. Hmm. Um, so I think that definition definitely has some you know, tie-in as it relates to what we're going to be dealing with in this show. Mm -hmm. That's deep. You know. And uh, as far as uh, Manu, if you, if you all do a, a search on Manu, it's going to give you a really long list of uh, meanings as, as it's related to Manu. Um, if you're into Sanskrit and you're into, you know, reading some of the ancient texts, that would be a really good start. So since we're saying that terms are interchangeable, and terms are applied depending on the culture that's applying them. The whole idea is that it's knowledge God. So we want you all to have a better understanding of what God is so that you can know what God is. Um, why don't we go ahead and uh, move into a, a quick break. And when we come back, we'll begin our first segment. Uh, is there proof that God is a man? Peace. Pigs. Hey, are you tired of those same old energy drinks with bad taste? Make a switch to Pitbull Energy Drink with a guaranteed no aftertaste. Pitbull offers more energy with ginseng and vitamins B6 and B12. With a ginger ale, lemon lime flavor, Pitbull meets the consumer's demand for better tasting and healthier energy products with a guaranteed no aftertaste. Make a switch to Pitbull Energy Drink. Pitbull offers more energy with ginseng and vitamins B6 and B12. With a ginger ale, lemon lime flavor, 
Pitbull meets the consumer's demand for better tasting and healthier energy products. For more information on Pitbull energy drinks, bars, and mixes, visit their website at hiphopbev.com. That's hiphopbev.com. Online orders available at hiphopbev.com. So we run faster Yeah, your main girl Jackie ain't hey, they come natural Gotta protect the set Waste off this a tackle Why they taking pictures of me? I am not an anchor They pick it Peace. Welcome back to the Knowledge of Self show. Uh, my name is uh, Tere Allah. To my left, it's Jack, uh, pardon self, Jerul Allah. <laughs> <laughs> peace, peace. Jack El Knowledge Allah. So before we went out on break, uh, I read a question. So this is uh, the first segment, and it's considered a question. Uh, is there proof that God is a man? So what we like to do is we like to hit the listening audience with uh, questions that will be answered throughout the discussion. Uh, our whole focus for this segment is to dispel the myth that God is a mystery because that's something that I can say that I was taught from the beginning and there never was really any explanation as to why uh, God is unseen and he's not heard and you can't you know, talk to him or touch him. So the whole idea for this segment is that we're going to show you or at least provide you with some proof um, using the Bible to be one of the primary texts to prove that uh, God is referenced as a man in the Bible to begin with. So I want to give it over to uh, Jaquil, uh to go ahead and head the discussion. Uh, so is God a man, brother? Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Peace. Well, um, I think for me personally, um, you know, de- coming from a Christian background, mm-hmm. you know, kind of probably like you brothers were too, I grew up kind of with that whole God is that unseen thing. Um, you know, he's in everything but you, right? You can see God in the tree. You can see him in the mountain, right? But no one ever said you can look in the mirror and see God in yourself, mm, right? Um, so, you know, that was always an interesting thing. Um, in any event, at a point in my life, <clears throat> um, you know, I just kind of came to some questions um, in my knowledge for, for the truth or my knowledge itself. And uh, I can just kind of want to lead you guys to uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to go ahead and read that from the Bible. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was God in the beginning. All right, so that verse, um, you know, obviously he's talking about Jesus. Um, and I think the interesting thing about that is Jesus, <clears throat> you know, himself makes that uh, claim that he is God many times. And as a Christian, you always hear that Jesus is God, and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then you hear that Jesus is your brother, and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But you never make the connection that if he's your brother and he's God, then that must mean you're God also. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you guys think about that? Yeah, peace. I think that that's really profound. Um, And I think if you really, like, just do the knowledge to the Bible and you really see what Jesus is saying. He's not really saying, like, worship me. He's coming more from the perspective of, like, look, I reached this level of achievement. You know, I was anointed based on my studies, and you guys have the ability to do the same. You just have to put in the work, mm-hmm. you know. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think I think uh, just piggybacking on what, uh, what you both built on is, is the idea that we have to assume a sense of responsibility as, as men. Um, so, so many times in our culture, since we have uh, a belief in a religion, 
or what we refer to as a mystery God, uh, anything that we do wrong, we just say, I'm just going to go and I'm going to pray about it. And then, you know, I'm going to try again the next day, as opposed to being truthful with yourself and actually trying to exercise that demon so that you will never do it again. It's called taking the devil off our planet. That's Mm. pretty much what we do. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, there's some other scriptures I want to give you guys. Uh, Matthew 12:48. <clears throat> um, you know, Jesus is questioning about who is his brothers and sisters, and that was the point I was making before. Um, so I just pick up here in voice, uh, verse 48. It said, "He replied to him, Who is my brother and who am part of me? Who is my mother and who are my brothers?" Pointing to his disciples, he said, "Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister." And my mother. So basically, Jesus is making, you know, that point that the people who do like I do, right? Those are my brothers and sisters, and those are the people mm-hmm. who are God like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Peace. Uh, did you want to want to continue with uh, the other two verses that we had there? Uh, so the, the the main thing I want to remind everyone about is this is not. Um, uh, a way of us, you know, bashing religion or or, or bashing um, Christian belief or anything of that nature. But it's, por- it's important that we send this message to everyone that you do truly have to look into what you practice and what you quote unquote believe in and um, try to find the truth in it. So uh, I want to let uh, Jaquil continue with uh, a couple of more verses uh, proving that God is a man. True indeed. Um, so in Genesis 1, uh, 26, <clears throat> it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. And then it goes on to continue. But the important part about that is it says, so here you, let me take it a step back. Here you have God um, who creates you know, everything, right? He does the whole creation thing, makes the mountains, the birds, and all that. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes to, and, and all that he did by himself. So then when it comes to making man, it makes the reference to us. And they said, let him make us in our image. Mm-hmm. Right? So he's obviously talking to someone else, asking for assist, assistance. Mm-hmm. And, okay, mm-hmm. let's let's do this together. Mm-hmm. Earlier, Jerul mentioned, you know, God, and you mentioned, we were talking about God, or when we say Allah, we mean the people, as a whole. So I think that's a good clue as to what we were talking about before and how that ties in. Right. And um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is take it back uh, to, to that point. Uh, those of you who have a Bible, you can look up uh, Genesis 5, uh, verse 2, um, about the whole idea of God being the people. So in, and I'm turning my pages. So. Uh, in Genesis 5, and by the way, I'm reading out of the, uh, the C.I. Schofield version of the Bible, um, King James Version. And chapter 5, verse 2 of Genesis says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Notice that part where it says, and called their name Adam. Okay, so this was shortly after saying, male and female created he them and blessed him and called their name Adam. Okay, so this is, it goes back to what we were saying about God being a body of people. And right. I remember we were building some days prior to that in Jerul, he said, you know, in the beginning we were one. Okay, so we're expressing um, the, the qualities of God, uh, the feminine and masculine qualities of God, so to speak. Right. So, um, and you, you can, y'all can disagree too. But if I'm saying it off, off text, <laughs> no, I see, feel free. I see where you're going with it. Okay. Definitely that. Um, we wanted to to continue in terms of uh, our focus about uh, Jesus, um, and one of the things I wanted to point out, which is the reason why I uh, chose these particular verses in the Bible. The first one comes from Luke uh, 21 through 38, and and because of its length. Um, I'm not necessarily going to read this one, but what needs to be mentioned just from from this verse alone is that Jesus has a lineage. So that means that within this lineage, uh, there are people mentioned. So if you take a look at uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 21 through 38, uh, it's visible proof that uh, some of the things that people generally tend to leave out is that Jesus came from a long, a long line of people that came before him. Um, and just in a nutshell, uh, 
his genealogy, at least mentioned in Luke, it talks about the genealogy of Mary. So they're talking about the people on his mother's side of the family. And uh, if you just go ahead and maybe read through that, uh, you can see that the last verse of this chapter, chapter 38, it takes it all the way back to uh, Adam, which is referred to as the Son of God. Uh, the next verse is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. And those of you who study uh, some of the history in Ethiopia, one of the things that you'll find out is that the kings in Ethiopia, uh, they claim a lineage back to uh, King David and King Solomon. Right. So one of the things that needs to be mentioned is that uh, King David and Jesse and Obed, Obed being the father of Jesse, Jesse being the father of David, all original men, um, those were Jesus' relatives. So Jesus came from somewhere. He came from uh, human beings. There's nowhere uh, except the controversial part of the Bible where it says that he was born of spirit in, uh, in Mary's womb. Now, again, uh, we're not here to, to bash the Christian religion, but what I'm saying is that through these texts right here, it does show and prove that uh, not only that Jesus is a man, but he also came from a line of men. Um, and these men were born through women as well. Right. So uh, it's important to, to keep this part in mind. Uh, we have some more building to do. Uh, let's go take it over to uh, Jay Rule. He has a couple of more pieces of evidence to support uh, what our build is about today. Knowledge God. Okay, so we're going to take it into uh, John. And uh, it's John 1034. Um, give me a second. Yeah, they, on a side note, um, for you Star uh, Star Wars fans out there, <laughs> right, check this out. Um, when the Emperor is talking to Anakin, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he tells him that his teacher, right, the Emperor's teacher, was able to create life through the Force. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that gets into the whole kind of Jesus mystery creation story, mm -hmm. even in Star Wars. So that's a tidbit for you uh, Star Wars <laughs> fans out there. Okay, uh, so Jaquil has the the Supreme Bible here, so I'm trying to decide. <laughs> okay, all right, here it is. So uh, the, the verse that we're dealing with, like I said, is 10, John 10:34, 10, uh, and it is uh, Jesus answered them, "It is not written in your law." I said, "Ye are gods." And basically, he's talking to uh, the Jews, and um, in that instance, he's basically just trying to show and prove that in your way of living, it says that you are gods. Mm. And, you know, y'all have the ability to do what I'm doing, but you have to, first and foremost, acknowledge that, that uh, or, or uh, be aware of that. And, uh, you know, from that awareness, you know, live it out. You right. Know? So... I think that's important. Um, you know, is yeah, you are God, but becoming God is a process, right? How how would you say that uh, you went about going through that process? I think that's something important for us to to share with people. How do we begin going into like going through this process to acknowledge that that we are God of ourselves, and that's something that's something that has to be said. And actually, it was Jerul a couple of years ago that hit me with that that statement. Mm -hmm that when I say I'm God, I'm not saying I'm God of you or anyone else in this room. I'm God of myself. So I think that's something that's really important for us to, to emphasize today. Okay, but um, you wanted to start as far as the process you went through. Yeah, um, definitely. I think part of it, the first step, um, you know, with any process or with anything in life is starting that knowledge. Um, so I think for me, one of the most important things that I did was to uh, was to do the knowledge, look, listen, and observe, pay attention to different things, and try and connect the dots. Um, you know, going on from different things that I heard, different stories that I've read in the Bible, different truths that I know, and see how they connected or didn't connect, and then you know if, if you can show it, prove it or not. Mm -hmm. What about what about you, Jeru? Uh For me, it was just really first and foremost looking at myself, like. You know, I was always my whole life looking outside of myself for answers. And, you know, it's like all the answers that I needed were, you know, right there in the mirror. 
you mm-hmm. know. So it was just really taking responsibility for my actions first and foremost, mm-hmm. and not making excuses anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. Yeah, that's important. Like you were saying, God. Um, when we say that we're God. Um, you know, we're not lording that over anyone else. I can't make you do anything. You can't make me do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, the most important part of that, though, is that you take ownership for the things that you do in your life. You know what I'm saying? Good, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's important about taking that ownership of God. And that's what Jesus was really trying to tell people about, teaching them freedom, justice, and equality, and to take ownership for the things that they did in their life. Mm-hmm. Good, right. bad, or indifferent. And, and that's true because uh, as far as the nature of violence in the world today, um, some people just make the excuse that it's okay to do certain things again because their sins are going to be washed away. But the the first step is when we knowledge God, we're acknowledging um, the fact that instinctively and by nature, especially original people, that we know right from wrong. Right. And uh, we actually know when we're doing the wrong thing because we feel it. Right. Um, now, if you want to explain that in terms of science, maybe it's a, a, a chemical <laughs> reaction that takes place, the idea of fear that you might get uh, arrested or punished by your parents. Um, but there's something deep within us, uh, a seed or what have you, which sure shows, a, you know, which we know um, the difference between right and wrong. I think, I think it's definitely something that uh you know it's 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 more than just i guess something you learn over time because i I look at my young son you know nine months old and when he does things he'll look at me knowing that he shouldn't do it (laughs) but he does it anyways you know what i mean so he already knows at nine months what right or wrong is right Mm -hmm. you know so it's just a matter of i guess you know learning Right, mm-hmm. right. Well, that's and that's kind of what it's about, right? The knowledge of God, right? So he's trying to figure out what can he do. He's like, okay, is this right? Is this wrong? Am I going to get in trouble for this? Let right. me see what mm-hmm. happens. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, add on to uh, uh, the discussion uh, right after the break? So we're going to say peace, and when we return, we're going to continue. Uh, is there proof that God is a man? And we'll hear a little bit about the Book of Thomas. Peace. 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 Welcome back to the Knowledge Yourself Show. And before we took a break, we were talking um, about the proof that exists that God is a man. So we hit you with a few verses um, from the Bible. My version is the uh, C.I. Schofield version of the Bible. And uh, Jaquil brought what we call the Niv. So <laughs> peace to uh, Kwame Allah for that one. You get your Niv. Uh, so what we wanted to do was pick up the discussion uh, with Jerul. Uh, He's going to tell us a little bit about the Book of Thomas, and I don't know how many of you have um, a Bible with the Book of Thomas in it, and if you do, consider yourself fortunate because it was one of those books that was actually left out of the the Bible, Um, and we'll actually get into a little bit of that uh, later on. So, uh, Jeroel, just go ahead and hit him with um, the Book of Thomas and how this relates to our discussion about God as a man. Okay, like, uh, you know, like Tere said that 
you know, the Book of Thomas was a book that was removed from the Bible. Um, the book was, from my research, it was removed bas basically because of the, uh, I guess, the profound nature of it. Um, there's a lot of, you know, jewels in it, a lot of information that, you know, anybody could pick up and read. It's not one of those things you really have to decipher. So the verse I'm going to read um, is the, thir the third verse, and it says, uh, Jesus said, if those who lead you see the kingdom, say the kingdom is in the sky, the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you it is in the sea, then the fish of the sea will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. And when you come to know yourselves, then you will become known. And you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you not know yourselves, you will dwell in poverty, and you will be that poverty. Peace. So, yeah, when you look at that, I mean, that, to me, sums up religion and <laughs> basically the whole topic of what we're dealing with. You know, the first part that talks about if those who lead you say that the kingdom is, you know, in the sky, then the birds will precede you. That seems to me that, you know, if those priests or pastors or people of the church say, you know, God is in a, is God is a mystery in the heavens that you'll never see, mm -hmm. you know, then whatever really they say will precede you, or the, the, they will be more in control of, I guess, your way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But Jesus right here tells you, you know, you got to know yourself or you will live in poverty. So you have to really take time to get to know yourself and see how you relate to everything else. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And, yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Um, there's another scripture in the Bible I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I'll definitely pull it up for you guys. We can put it on our Facebook page, um, Knowledge Yourself, uh, Facebook. Um, but it says, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is within. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's right in line with what you're talking about. You know, looking within yourself <clears throat> and, you know, not looking for something greater than you outside of yourself. Right. And, and, and you know, it goes back to, to what we say about uh, our children in terms of the idea of, of innocence. So I remember sitting, sitting in the car with my father one day and um, some children were crossing the street. And he said, he said, those are the most innocent people on earth. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, children. Okay, so we have to think, uh, where does this evil come from? You know, if we can say that when we look at a baby that he or she is innocent, um, you know, and then their first words and everything that happens after that, uh, we don't lose that innocence. What we lose uh, is uh, the knowledge of ourself or the knowledge of our true nature. Um, and it goes back to what we said earlier, knowledge God. Hmm. Um, when we lose, lose the knowledge of ourself, then we lose touch with that righteousness, that true righteousness that we were born with. So um, I really like that 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 uh, that verse in Thomas. Yeah, it's powerful. Kinda, it kind of hits the spot. <laughs> um, so uh, we have uh, a couple of more things to share with you, um, beginning with uh, the book of uh, Philippians. Uh, so we're going to build on Philippians chapter two, uh, verse five through seven. Uh, so if you have your, your NIV or your, your, uh, your Bible Supreme handy, Bible. go ahead and uh, look this up or at least write the notes down. Yeah, give me a moment to find that one, God. Um. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to say is that um, those of us here and actually uh, the people in, in the Love of Law Cipher, uh, we spend quite a bit of time, you know, reading the Holy Quran, reading the Bible. Um, and reading a variety of texts to gain a greater understanding of uh, knowledge God or just a greater understanding of ourselves. So a couple of the books that we're referring to throughout this discussion, one of them is uh, what you hear about a little bit more later. It's called uh, Stolen Legacy uh, by George G.M. James. And this is uh, some heavy knowledge about the early mystery schools um, in Egypt. Uh, and their role in terms of the math and sciences in the world. Uh, we also brought a book titled The Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden, which is a, a really interesting text because it does include uh, several writings that were also left out of the Bible uh, through one said name, Council, which we'll talk about um, later on in the show. <laughs> and 
Yeah, I brought a couple books. I got a book called Knowledge Itself mm -hmm. by Supreme Understanding. Um, basically, this book deals with a variety of different topics, you know, from uh, various different religions, and really it's just about how you tie into everything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, also, I brought uh, the Book of God. Um, basically, this book deals with, you know, God and various different scriptures, and is very in depth. It's by True Islam. And the last book that I brought uh, is an older book. You probably have to go online to find this one, but this is The History of the Christian Religion to the t First 200 Years by Charles Waite. So, yeah, that's what I brought. All right. You, you good with Philippians? I'm Check ready here. with Philippians. Peace. Indeed. So, go ahead, God. Philippians 2, um, 5, for everyone who's got your Bible um, at home, says, Your attitude should be the same of that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, um, and being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Mm -hmm. So what do we make of that, that phrase, likeness of men? I mean, what does it mean, and, and this is also a question for everyone out there, what does it mean to, to refer to the likeness of man? You would like to add on to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think when he's talking about being made in the likeness of man, you know, um, in our nation, 5%, when we say Allah, you know, we always use the acronym arm, leg, leg, arm, head. So mm -hmm. when it's talking about God being made um, or Jesus being made in the image of man, it's just letting you know that he's a man just like you are. You mm -hmm. know, he's got two legs, two arms, a head. He puts his socks on, mm -hmm. you know, one foot at a time, just like you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he pretty much covered it right there. I mean, it just shows equality, um, you know, that, you know, this, this, this brother Jesus, who was a profound person, was able to sit next to people who would be considered the least profound, you know, and, and, and eat with them and, and teach them and, you know, be shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with them, you know what I mean? I think that's profound, right? Uh, you know. And you notice the, the suffix on the end of likeness. So I'll just take ness off and just say like men. So mm. what does it mean to be like men? That's You're a man, okay? <laughs> this, this, there's no way, there's no like a man. Um, it would be the equivalent of saying like a woman, but like man, likeness meaning um, a picture or, you know. A copy Right, of exact, or, right. Uh -huh. So uh, that's, that's how I see that. Um, Moving along, uh, I wanted to uh, share with you, and we all had agreed on sharing this with you. Uh, there are two more verses in the Bible that we wanted to share. Uh, the first one comes from Genesis 14, 17 through 19. Um, and I just wanted to, to just kind of recap how this all ties in. It's just proving that man is God. So if you have uh, Genesis uh, 14, 17 through 19 in front of you, I want to take a look at that. And uh, I can shed some, um, some understanding. So it says, um, in reference to a king by the name of Melchizedek. Uh, basically, I'm just going to paraphrase this story. Basically, uh, Melchizedek was uh, one who was declared the king of Salem. And this is one of a uh, few verses in the Bible that actually mentions that a person had no beginning of days and no ending of days. So to be more specific, I'm going to move you from Genesis 14, uh, verses 17 through 19, to Hebrews 7, 4, because it's, it's even more um, specific about that. So this is kind of how we study where we have to go back and forth. Um, Indeed. While you wait for that, I brought a book also, Christianity Before Christ. Um, it's a great book. It doesn't uh, take away anything from Jesus Christ, um, but it does go into how there was a Christianity before him, what kind of existed, and where that came from, and kind of how it got, and which we'll go into a little bit later in the show, and how it got kind of switched around into what we see now as Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also wanted to say that we have a Twitter. Um, so if you guys want to get some more information, I'm going to definitely list these books on the Twitter. Um, the Twitter is at KOS123. Um, so I'll, I'll list some books and put some articles and stuff up there that you guys can examine. Mm -hmm. All right, so 
Thank you, brothers. Let's go ahead and uh, share uh, what we have. So it's, it's Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4. Uh, and I'll begin with, uh, with verse 1. So it says, uh, For this Melchizedek king of Salem, priest of the Most High, God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So this is a really good example of how the Bible um, highlights or presents people that are given the, the, the godliness or the godlikeness, but actually they appear as man. Okay, so this goes back to the idea of knowledge God. So when we say that God is a man, uh, we're referring to the fact that God is alive. God is someone that speaks, you can see him, um, he breathes, um, he has feelings and everything else. And things like feelings are also shared in the Bible to describe God. Right. So uh, that, that, that's a really profound verse. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and uh, roll over into uh, segment two. And segment two is a really important part of the show because now we're going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the history um, of men and certain events that took place, uh, which, which basically is proof of knowledge God. So we're going to take a quick break, and uh, we'll come back at you. Peace. 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 Welcome back to the Knowledge Yourself Show. Um, to Ray, back at you. To Rule, right here. Peace. Jaquil, Knowledge Allah. So, w before we went out on break, uh, I talked a little bit about how we're going to build on uh, the history behind um, some of the belief systems that came out of uh, making God into a spirit as opposed to God's true essence, which we say is man. So, uh, well versed in this topic is uh, the brother Jay Rule. And we're all actually going to build on how the European colonization of Egypt uh, led to this change and transformation of uh, some of the information that came out of the mystery schools of Egypt and actually wound up in the Bible and in some of the practices that we can see today in major religions. Right. So I'm going to let Jay Rule um, sort of uh, build on that in the beginning. We can all add on. So this, this topic is very deep. So, you know, obviously it's not something that we could you know wrap up in a matter of minutes so I think it's important that we all go and do our own research on it to get some further understanding from it um, but basically I'm gonna just start with uh, the first in the first three centuries of Christianity 
uh, or the first three centuries from, um, you know, the, the death of Christ, uh, we, we had a Christianity that was known as Gnostic Christianity. And when you look at what the actual meaning of Gnostic is, that'll take you to a, a Greek word which deals with knowledge. So basically that just means that, you know, the early uh, so-called church fathers and, and men who dealt with uh, Christianity took more of a scientific and, and, and knowledge approach to the Bible and their way of e existing. So they looked at the Bible more from a means of s symbolism, and they looked at how it connected to the different sciences of the time. Mm. And just like uh, Ture mentioned, when you look at um, you know Alexander the Great and his 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 uh, conquering of Egypt, that opened the door for the world to come in and just pillage and take the various information that was existing in Egypt. Mm -hmm. right. So that wasn't too great for us, huh? But it was great for him. Oh, of course. <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah, it didn't look too good for us. So, uh, Some of the early Gnostic, uh, profound Gnostic um, individuals are, are uh, Simon Magus, um, a guy named uh, Sarithus, uh, Capocrates, and Mark Coney, and to name a few. Mm -hmm. So I'll list this on the Twitter so you guys can do your own individual research on it. Um, but moving forward, uh, one of the most profound figures uh, who took more of a scientific approach to the Bible was a man named Origen. Uh, and Origen is said to have been born in Egypt, Alexander, Egypt uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And uh, basically his father was a very profound man named Clement of Alexander. And he taught his son basically the foundations of... Uh, the various different, I guess, mysteries of Egypt and or Kemet. Uh, this was 185 A.D. when he was born. Um, the reason why I'm mentioning him is because he had a profound influence on Arius, which I'll, I'll talk about him later. But basically, his main teaching was that... Uh, I'll take a quote from him. It says, the characteristic relation of the Trinity is that the Father acts indirectly upon things, the Son or Word acts in all beings, and the Spirit is in all things reasonable and sanctified. Hmm. So mm -hmm. how do y'all see that? Well, I mean, one of the things I wanted to, to look into uh, was where, where Origen got this knowledge from. Um, but but his, his whole concept of God was... Uh, somewhat different or way different than what was being taught during that time. So he was really trying to promote uh, what the essence of God is, that being within man, as opposed to it being outside of himself right. and him trying to find that and worship that. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's how I see that. I mean, um, about how long did we agree that Alexander the Great, from Alexander the Great to origin, it's, it's several hundred years yeah. between mm -hmm. that time, that uh, the Europeans had colonized Egypt and they had uh, went into the mystery schools. And I know one of the things that came out of this, this part of history was that they started um, closing those schools down during this time mm. Um, mm. because they were advocating that they wanted, um, you know, Catholicism or cri uh, Christian practices prevalent in the country. Mm. So. Right, right. I think that's interesting that you mentioned that, right? So it's kind of the... Uh the narrowing, or like we built about earlier in the show, religion, and kind of putting the box on what Christianity was going to be mm -hmm. defined as, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then who could who could uh, go against that because you don't have um, access to those books, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because they're closing down those libraries, hiding those books from you, mm -hmm. burning them, and destroying the libraries. So, Jeru, how does uh, how does Constantine and the Council of Nicaea? Um, how does that tie into how how that concept of uh, of God, you know, as it relates to man? How did that uh, relate to that? Okay, so uh, Arius uh, was another individual who was, I guess, unorthodox in his in his practices as it relates to Christianity, mm -hmm. um, relating to the Catholic Church. Um, Right, unorthodox to them. Right, to them, right. <laughs> yeah, as it relates to the church. So Normal for us. Yeah, so he took more of a scientific approach 
one of his main, uh, I guess, his mainstay would be that um, he said that God Almighty and Jesus are, are of the same essence. So basically meaning that, you know, there is no separation. And then when you deal with the Bible and you see how we, you know, what we built about earlier as it relates to Jesus is our brother, right. we're of that same essence as well. Mm -hmm. um, but his, his teachings were, were highly controversial for the times, and he was criticized. So they basically, you know, he had a, a good following of people who dealt with, de dealt with the science that he was dealing with. So, you know, the church basically was like, we can't have this, you know. Mm -hmm. So Constantine, you know, he got the group of Ni uh, Council of Nicaea together, and they had a meeting. And So that was after Constantine kind of consolidated Rome itself. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I'm, I'm speeding forward. But, yeah, Constantine, you know, he was, uh, he was an emperor of only a small region at first in Rome. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he began battling with different with, with the other different emperors and he ended up conquering them and then he became the sole emperor. Mm -hmm. He was the first emperor to adopt Christianity also. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, you know, right. Arius was profound in his teachings. He had a following and a lot of the people who were, I guess, Constantine's right hand men, right hand men were like, you know, we gotta do something about this. So So uh I know that we're we're kind of short on time, so I wanted to know: uh, Has anything changed in Christian doctrine since this time period? Yeah, like you could, like I said, you know, prior to or oh, the first three centuries, you had more of a scientific approach to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Once the Council of Nicaea met, that's when the changes were made, and they were they basically put everyone in the box that Jacquel was dealing dealing with, and you said, and they said that you can only practice Christianity this way. If you practice it any other way, you're going to be burnt at the stake. Right. <laughs> That's pretty serious, it's raw, like huh? that. it's raw like that, so yeah. Um, no, I was also going to mention, at that council, it's also um, where they kind of canonized the Bible. Right. Mm. Um, and so that's also important because, um, you know, you have the addition in some places of certain things and you have the subtraction, mm -hmm. right? You know, dealing with today's math, right? Build or destroy, mm. right? right? You know what I'm saying? They're adding certain things and they're taking away certain mm -hmm. things. They definitely took away a lot of the books. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wanted to give this to all of you. Uh, it's, the, the name is Septuagint, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's S-E-P-T-U-A-G-I-N-T. -E so this was a council of like 70 to 72 people who got together in Alexandria and they actually translated um, the Hebrew written version of the Old Testament into Greek. So it's, it's really important for you to look into that and you know the current Bible that we're reading now actually was something that was translated by 70 or 72 people. Um, why don't we go ahead and move on to uh, the last part of it. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, and we wanted to give you all some information about health and fitness. Well, my brothers here, these are two of the most healthiest brothers I know. Let <laughs> me give it over to Jeru uh, yeah. about some of the superfoods. Okay, so yeah, we got some superfoods, um, you know, things that you can eat that will definitely boost your immune system and, you know, kind of help you to live a healthier life. We got beans, cage-free organic eggs, kiwi, quinoa, non-dairy low fat uh, low fat yogurt nuts broccoli wild Alaskan salmon sweet potatoes and berries um, also I wanted to mention something regarding the flu shots also I'll put this up on the Twitter um, basically with flu shots uh, I would avoid them don't get them yeah don't get them I would avoid them um, basically there's been a lot of science to prove that flu shots actually aren't as good for you as we would think but like I'll put some more information on the Twitter at KOS123 um, but I'll pass it over to Jack Hill right indeed I just wanted to add on um, the flu shots for one uh, they tend to be at least a year if not two years behind um, the current strain of flu not to mention that they piggyback other things um, in that vaccination that they're giving you so that's important to stay away from other than that on a health tip um, you know, it's important to drink a lot of water. I'd say for everyone, make sure you drink one liter of water for every 50 pounds of body weight. Um, and that's how you keep yourself hydrated and it'll help, uh, you know, with dealing with the flu and things like mm -hmm. that. We'd like to thank you for joining us again. We'll see you next weekend. Peace. Peace. Peace.